Hey Bible lovers, I'm Tim Nichols and I'm here to bring you your Nichols Worth and today we're doing something a little bit different from Hendrickson Publishing as we're not reviewing a Bible but more of a historical work. I've actually got this along with Josephus and Eusebius's Ecclesiastical History and of course the works of Philo. Now they have all three of these in Hendrickson but you are going to be able to tell that these covers look quite a bit different than this one. That's because these are previous editions and this one is a new updated edition. Anyhow, check out these pictures to see an example of how these two look in their updated cover and you'll notice they look very similar to this one. So now let's take a look at Philo and we'll push these out of the way just for a second because who Philo was is Philo was actually a Hellenized Jew that lived in Alexandria and he was a philosopher and he kind of studied Platonic thinking. He adopted and accepted the Greek culture. So what we have here is a pretty interesting view of what Jews would have been like sometime during the lifetime of Jesus and even Paul. It's believed that he died somewhere in the 30s to 50s AD. The date isn't really ironclad. This is a glued binding. So that's something you want to keep an eye on because it can tend to break apart. But these things are extremely affordable. And paper liner, I don't see any reinforcement, but again with the glued binding, this just kind of is what it is. Philo of Alexandria, what this essentially is, it's really cool, is it's a commentary on the books of Moses from around the time of Jesus. So you are going to have a Greek philosophical view of Moses' work, and it also kind of gives you some character profiles of people like Abraham, people like Moses, of course, people like Joseph, people like Isaac, and some of the early patriarchs. You want to know like a Second Temple era that isn't like Enochian because he doesn't reference Enoch. He doesn't reference any of the Apocrypha in here. So this is going to be a strict Judaism look from a Greek Hellenized perspective. It's believed that he was a Pharisee, which is kind of interesting because the Pharisees were the ones that really clung to traditions. So while they spoke Greek and maybe thought Greek, this is going to give you your traditional look at how Jews viewed life in a Greek world. So here's the allegorical interpretation of the books of Moses, and this is broken down into a couple of categories. Then you have the cherubim, most specifically the cherubim that blocked Adam's entry into the garden and the nature of cherubim and how they, it's, it's just super interesting. The sacrifices of Cain and Abel, why was one accepted and the other wasn't? The posterity of exile of Cain, so basically why was Cain exiled on the giants? Husbandry on how Noah became a person who raised grapes, which ultimately ended up becoming wine and how he ended up getting drunk and all this other stuff and their position on alcohol, prayers and curses uttered by Noah when he became sober. I love that. Confusion of tongues, which is a story of Babel. So you're really breaking down the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, and all the works of Moses. This is when Jacob has the dream with Jacob's ladder. So he kind of breaks down the difference between dreams and visions, how they operate. Super interesting perspective from 2,000 years ago from a Hellenized Jew, uh, Abraham, we have Moses, broken down, but let's get toward the end. There's really something I want you to see. Uh, the contemplative life, that's something that he's really well known for. And then on the eternity of the world, one thing about like Greek thinking is they believe, number one, in the eternity of pretty much everything. And then they also believe that as things go on earth, they kind of match in the heavenlies. He talks about how there's like living things in the water, how there's living things on the earth, and then how there's living things in the sky, but there's also living things in the heavens, which would be like your angels and your demons and, and all these different things, of course, apart from God. So then you have questions on Genesis. And what he does, this is really cool, is he takes on different questions of every kind of major question that Genesis asks about creation, about angels and demons in here. He addresses the giants. So it's just broken down. I'll, I'll read you a couple of examples of each question so that you kind of get an idea as to what's going on here. For example, question number 36, it says, what is the meaning of the expression, you shall be gods, knowing good and evil? And then he goes on and answers the question. I'll read you a little bit of it real quick. Whence was it that the serpent found the plural word gods when there is only one true God when this is the first time that he names him. But perhaps this arises from there having been in him a certain prescient wisdom by which he now declared the notion of the multitude of gods which was at a future time to prevail amongst men. So it's kind of addressing you shall be like gods where 
Satan here, or the serpent, is acknowledging that there's more spiritual beings than just God Elohim, that sometimes Elohim can refer to angels or falling spirits. So, all kinds of interesting questions. Why did the serpent accost the woman and not the man? He answers that question. And again, 2,000 years ago, we're getting these answers. Another thing that I recommend is you go ahead and get all three of them, because this was written somewhere in the 300s, so you're going to get an early church history somewhere around the Council of Nicene, and you're going to be getting some of those perspectives. And then Josephus, he actually defected to the Romans and was a historian for Rome. So you're going to have your Greek Alexandrian perspective, you're going to have your Nicene perspective, and then you are going to have your Roman perspective all from well-respected early church leaders and these two specifically being unconverted Jews. So that's what I recommend. Yes, they are difficult to read. Yes, you may not sit there and read them like a book, reading them through and through, but there are going to be times where these are going to be useful resources. That's one thing I love about Hendrickson, is they preserve ancient works to include several early English Bibles. They also have the Septuagint that was translated by Sir Brenton, and so much amazing material. They have commentaries, they have works from Spurgeon and beyond, Anything you want, these are all kind of like facsimiles and copies, so they're not going to be retypeset or anything like that, but it is going to preserve this information that you're able to use for decades to come. So there you have it. Keep calm, Jesus on. This is your nigga's worth.